All right, we are live. That um, that sounds good. Uh, sorry for being late. We just had a few technical difficulties, but um, as usual, we are here uh, with a VJUX session. Um, well, I'm Brian, and I will um, I will host the session today. And uh, well, let me just uh, first uh, open my uh, my slides. So you will see my opening slide here. Welcome to the VJUG. Uh, the VJUG is a virtual jug, totally virtual. And you can uh, see this uh, recording uh, later on, but you can also join us live as you probably do now. By that, we, I think we are the most environmental friendly jug in the world because we do not have to fly speakers in. We just bring them in virtually, which I believe is the best thing we can do. Um, if you do not have a, have a jug near you uh, or you're not able to join it or you just want to have more, more content, I think the virtual jug is the perfect solution. Um, I'm Brian, I work for Sneak and I will be your host today. Basically what I will do, I will just introduce uh, our, uh, our speaker and we'll leave it up to him and I will be the proxy between the viewers, you and Roy. So he will not be interrupt uh, interrupted by 415 questions within a minute. I will streamline that. Uh, Sneak is also our sponsor, our main sponsor for today, because uh, they hooked us up with this uh, Zoom stuff so we can do this uh, webinar. I will not go into details anymore because this is the most important part. Today we are we are going to talk about the mystery of, of untangling the mystery of qubits. And uh, I know uh, Roy uh, will be presenting, and as I know for sure, he also has a co-host we, we, that he will probably introduce in a few seconds. Um, I already see it in the in the camera that, that we have Mr. Qubit uh, uh, available, but he will introduce it um, in a second. Yes. Um, for for now, um, if you have any questions, please join our Slack channel and uh, ask for questions over there, because in the live session channel on Slack, we will uh, moderate the questions and I will uh, move them up to uh, Roy at an appropriate time. Um, Please afterwards share this uh, message, share this video with the friends, family, and preferably both. If you have any feedback, uh, you can ping us on Twitter or, or put it on the, the Slack channel as well, but you can also ping us on Twitter uh, at Virgil Juk or uh, personally at my uh, Twitter handle at Brian Verm. So without uh, further ado, I will stop sharing my stuff. And uh, now you see uh, Roy in the video. Uh, Roy, welcome. Uh, for and, and thank you for being here. As I'm, if, if I'm not mistaken, you're at the opening of your own new office. You're because you're the managing director of Open Value Rotterdam. Yes. Uh, so, so you're actually you actually have to have to miss the party now and join us for the virtual virtual jug. Yeah. So um, uh, Open Value actually there are a couple of Open Value. We we've got one in München. Uh, there's one in Utrecht and there's one in Rotterdam. And I'm leading the Rotterdam branch. And at the moment we are in Utrecht and um, right behind me, there are hundreds of people having drinks, eating snacks, and I'm sitting here talking to you, so. Well, I love that. I mean, uh, Roy, for those of you who don't know, Roy is a Java champion, a Java One rock star, and uh, well, a well-known speaker uh, uh, like on, on Java One, Code One, all the DevOps probably uh, some more. And he is also the lead of the Rotterdam uh, Java user group. So thank you very much for, for being here, Roy. And from now on, I leave it all up to you. So um, go ahead, enjoy it. Thank you. So I'll start sharing my screen, which is working now, hopefully. And then I can start the slides and I can do the talk. There you go. Um, so today we are going to talk about quantum computing, about qubits and well, basically how all this stuff works. And it's a very complicated topic, but in the next hour, maybe a little bit shorter, we will cover the basics. And I'm not doing this alone. I've got my co-host with me. Um, like you said, this is me. Uh, I'm a groundbreaker ambassador, used the Oracle Cloud. You have to. Uh, leading the Rotterdam Jug, Java champion. I still work for JPoint, but I'm also the director of Open Value. And I tweet and I blog. So before we start, Brian, um, a disclaimer. We are going to take a couple of shortcuts. It's a very complicated topic and we can't possibly cover everything. So we have to take some shortcuts here. 
Um, and another warning, minds will be blown. Uh, this is inevitable. Uh, it's all part of computing. Minds will be blown. So when you think of computing, classical computers, they use binary. So you have either a zero or a one. And one thing a lot of people say is, well, when you do quantum computing, you have zero, one, or both at the same time, like a third state. And this is not true. So everyone that says you've got zero, one, and a third state, or something in between, random, it will all become clear in about an hour. So our classical computer, what does it do? Well, we use logic gates to flip these bits. So these bits are zero or one, and we flip them. That's all there is to it. That's what my phone does. That's what your computer does. All it does is flipping bits. This bit is on, this bit turns off. Those bits are on, those bits are turned on. It's that simple. So quantum computers work in a different way. Um, they store information in a different way and computing is done in a different way. And this is, requires a whole new um, way of thinking. So that's what we'll get into. So quantum computers store their information, not in bits that are zero or one, but in a qubit. And a qubit is always in some state. This state can be entirely zero. That state can be entirely one, but it's always somewhere, it can be anywhere in between. So it can be uh, a high probability of zero and a very low probability of being one or the way around. But first, why do we need these quantum computers? Well, um, there is a simple example that's being used a lot, uh, prime factorization. So this is very easy. You multiply two relatively large numbers and you get a very large number. Any handheld calculator can do this. Your phone can do this. Heck, if you give me a piece of paper, I could probably do this by hand. Um, but the other way around, very complicated. I give you a big number. What are the two prime factors? This is something um, computers are very bad at. Um, if you plot this on a graph, there are uh, a lot of different algorithms. And this is the typical P is NP uh, graph we have. There are some problems that are hard, such as prime factorization, but there are also a lot of things we've solved in computing that are easy. Sorting, for example, is easy. We can do sorting very quickly. Um, prime factorization, not so much. But if we have quantum computers, we get a whole new category. And this, is, this category is called quantum easy algorithms. And for example, prime factorization is one of the uh, quantum easy things we know. So if we have good working quantum computers, prime factorization is solved. We can do that very efficiently. Quantum computers work using uh, uh, quantum mechanical phenomena, which is a horrible word to say, but I've said it now horrible uh, uh, thousands of times, but phenomena, it's a real tongue twister. So what are quantum mechanical phenomena? Well, this is water. And if we zoom in further, we get to molecules. And if we zoom in further, we already know a molecule is H2O. We can break this up, uh, we get H's and O's. And then in, in this slide, I've, I've picked the O, it's oxygen, and it's no longer water, it, now it's just pure oxygen. But this oxygen, we can split it up even further. We can split it up into eight electrons and um, uh, eight protons and eight, eight, eight neutrons. And if we would take, for example, a proton and we'd zoom in even further, we get to up quarks and down quarks. So, it turns out this is as low as we can go at the moment, and, and a whole new periodic table uh, exists at this scale. So, for example, if you look at these things, there are up quarks, down quark, strange charm and bottom quarks. Uh, there's the photon, uh, Higgs boson, electron. A lot of things I didn't even know existed. When I was at school, these things weren't even invented yet. Um, and these particles behave very strange. Uh, especially the strange quark, it's even called strange. Um, for example, uh, a very famous example is the double slit experiment. So you take a wall 
and another wall and you make two small slits. And if you would throw tennis balls and you will record where they hit the second wall, this is what you would expect. And if you would throw tennis balls, this is exactly the pattern you'll get. But if you do the same thing using, for example, photons or electrons, these very tiny particles, this is what you'll get. It's no longer the pattern we, um, if they were actually particles, we would like a tennis ball. This, we can't really explain this. So these things behave like waves. They interact with each other. And that's why you have this diffusion pattern appear. And the weird thing is, if we start to measure, for example, for a photon through which slit it actually goes, the pattern collapses and it goes back to this. Very weird. So what have we learned? Well, quantum mechanics are uh, quantum mechanics are weird, hard to understand, and invisible. Turns out this is not true, though. Um, for example, uh, I have a Polaroid glass, um, and these Polaroid glasses filter light. Let's do a small demo with uh, these quantum effects. Hi. Hi. I'm very busy. I'm live streaming. <laughs> See, mm -hmm. a lot of people. Um, a small demo using quantum effects. For example, if we have three polarizing filters. So with these three filters, we can filter out light. One thing you need to know about light, light, when it's emitted from a light source, for example, um, uh, from a heat source, for example, the sun or an uh, incandescent light bulb, um, it's polarized in all directions. And polarization means it's uh, going either up and down or left and right or in any angle. So light from the sun is polarized in each and every direction. If we take so, uh, one of these filters, they work like blinds. They are horizontal. And um, so if light's coming through and it's going like uh, up and down, it gets blocked 100% of the time. If it goes left to right, it can go right through the blinds because that's where the openings are. If it's in between, it blocks about half the light. And this, this is very weird. So if we would look at an example, it's me playing with Lego. Um, you see this filter blocks half of the light. So what happens, um, oh yeah, one important detail, after it passes a filter, we've actually changed the light. It's now oriented in the only direction possible. It's the direction that the filter is filtering. In. So even if it was at an angle and it made it through because it was 50% of the time going through, after passing through, it is now completely horizontal. Now we introduce a second filter. And this filter is perpendicular on the, on the first filter. So now light that's going, uh, ho coming horizontally is completely blocked light that's coming in vertically, that's, that can go right through. So what happens if you place a second filter behind this? Oh, if we have it oriented in the same way, all the light comes through. But if we turn it 90 degrees, it blocks all light. This is a simple equation. First, you see it is randomly polarized in all directions. It goes to the first filter. 50% of the light makes it through. And it's all horizontal. Now. Because it's horizontal and it goes through the second filter, which is vertically polarized, no light comes through. Now the strangest thing, if we would take a third filter and we would place it at an angle in the middle, this is what happens. Suddenly light comes through, which is mind blowing. Oh wait, mind blowing. I've got an animation for that. So in my world, this should not happen. If you block something and you add a third filter, it should block this. It, 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 there's no way light changes like that. But it turns out if you, if you follow the rules I, I said before, um, if you do it at the first filter, 50% of the light comes through. At the second filter, there's still 25% of the light. And at the last filter, you filter again half of the, the original light and you've, got, you've still got light left. It turns out if you add more and more filters at smaller angles, you can actually get more and more light passing through. Mind-blowing, very weird. 
So these quantum effects, they aren't invisible, they are all around us, but they're just hard to notice because they are so weird. We don't think about these things. So if we will build a quantum computer, what will be in a quantum computer? Um, we could actually use photon polarization like we just did. There are quantum computers that are using these effects. Um, we could use the spin of an electron. Uh, electrons aren't physically spinning around, but they've got, an, uh, uh, they've got a thing called spin. Uh, uh, nuclei also have a thing called spin, and we could use these effects as well in a quantum computer. There's also the Josephson junction, which is a very small electric circuit, which behaves like, um, which behaves quantum weird. So this is actually a very useful thing because um, all our computers are electrical circuits. So this is a very good candidate to use. Um, we can also make something that's called a quantum dot, which is uh, something larger than these very small uh, fundamental particles. They can be as large as a couple of molecules. Um, so that it makes them easier to uh, to use. Uh, these things are actually used in te televisions, for example. You've got quantum dot televisions, but they aren't very good. Um, there are some problems, though, because if we want to manipulate those objects, those very tiny objects, and their heat, heat means stuff moving around. So if there's heat in a system, it means all these tiny particles we want to, to manipulate, they are all over the place. So the only way to actually use these particles is to cool them down to near the absolute zero. That's when they finally stop moving around. And that's when you can do uh, manipulations. The only problem though, you want to interface to a regular computer, for example, and uh, put in calculations. But these calculations are electrical. So they are made, of, made up of electrons. And to these electrons, they need to move because if your computer is in absolute zero, nothing happens, everything's frozen. So there's always information leakage and there's always an interface that uh, requires heat. And this is where a lot of uh, problems arise when building an actual quantum computer. So what do these quantum computers look like? Well, here's, a, here's an example. They look like fancy chandeliers. Um, they're isolated, uh, um, so that's why they hang from ceilings. They are isolated uh, and they are cooled uh, to the absolute zero, um, and that's the only way to actually let them operate. So right now in this room, it's too hot for a quantum computer, um, but let's build one anyway. So we are not going to use a physical machine. We are going to build a simulator, and we're going to use Java for that, obviously, because it's a joke. Um, but first, I need to uh, to uh, to call in Mr. Qubit. Mr. Qubit is my is my uh, is my helper, and I'll quickly stop sharing my screen so you can see him. There you go. Where are you? There you are. Look, here's Mr. Qubit. Um, I do like a split screen thing, uh, Brian. Um, let me see. Normally, if you if you talk and you show the and you show the the, the slides, uh, we do see you in the upper uh, uh, upper right hand oh. corner. So so oh, the, it, it's a small way, but you but you but we but we see you, uh, you we see you talk anyway. So oh, no that worries. Should be, that should be enough. That should be enough. Let's let's just keep it that way. So you can see Mr. Cubit, right? Yes, I can see. Um, so what we use in quantum computing is something called a block sphere. And a block sphere is a very simple model um, that shows the state of a system. And in our case, let's use Mr. Qubit. He's got this little handle thingy and it can be anywhere. But important rule, if this thing is pointing up, this thing is entirely 100% zero. And if we point it down, this thing is 100% guaranteed to be a one. If it's in between, nobody knows. It's, if it's like this, it's a 50-50 chance of when you measure this thing that it goes Doop! or that it goes Doop! So it, if it's like this, it can become a zero, it can become a one, it can be anything. So a little bit of math, just this is the only thing. Um, the state of a qubit is 
a certain imaginary probability of it being zero and a probability of it being one. And if you uh, clamp this uh, to be uh, uh, the same probability if you square it, it's the same as if this is on a circle and this qubit is right. So how would we code this? Like I said, we have a complex number. So this is an imaginary number. Uh, it, can, it has a real part and an imaginary part. And this number can be between uh, zero and one. So there's a probability of it being zero, which is the alpha here. And there's a probability of it being one, it's the beta. This is all you need for a single qubit in Java. Uh, Albert Einstein said, well, God this does not play dice with the universe. Um, turns out he was wrong. He was wrong about quantum computing because if we want to take a measurement in Java code of our qubit, the first thing we do, mat.random. We need a number between zero and one to do our measurement. And then we just walk through the real parts of our system, which is now just a single qubit. And if it meets the threshold, then we decide if it's a zero or a one. In this case, there was a 1.0 probability of it being zero. So we always measure a zero. If we would flip this code and we would make the second uh, 1.0 and the first 0.0, uh, we would always measure a one. This is all there is to it if you want to simulate a single qubit. Very few lines of code. So what can we do with this? Well, our, our binary system uses logic gates to flip bits. And in a, in a quantum computer, it's not very different. It's about the same. Uh, but we use uh, these matrix functions. Um, it's much easier with an example. So let's just take the first uh, couple of uh, the, the most basic uh, gates there are, the not gates. There's a not right. gate. Yes. Right. Right. Just to, inter uh, to interrupt you shortly because we uh, we do see your slides, but we uh, I think we see your we see two slides next to each other, so we actually can see the following slide already. So oh. you're probably sh sharing oh, your your your, your your you're sharing the wrong view, which is no problem because it is. Well, funny, but we already saw the Albert Einstein joke before you um, ah, actually came to it. Then this is better. This, this is much better. It's let's let's better. continue. Uh, all right. I should, that's the thing. I've been a Java programmer for 20 years, but I'm still unable to use Keynote or share screens or print some print a document. These things are, are beyond my skill level. The, 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 these are man, these are manager level things, right? Yeah. So so yeah, we have we need to grow to that point. I know, but yeah. uh, may, may, maybe maybe in ten maybe in ten years or so. I don't know. Who I've got knows? problems with that as well. Who knows? But yes. yeah, let's continue, man. The not gate. So um, this is Mr. Qubit. Mr. Qubit right now is a zero because he's pointing upwards, and. Polly uses the, let's go back one slide, Polly uses the following um, diagonal lines. So this line here, going right through Mr. Qubit, is the x coordinate. And if we would apply a Polly x mutation on Mr. Qubit, the following thing happens. You see what happened? Now he's like this. Now he's like this. So it turns. 100% possibility of it being zero into 100% possibility of it being one. And if we would apply the same operation again, we are back to zero again. It's that simple. And if we would, for example, take the poly y, y is this axis going, now it's a zero, now it's a one, and now it's a zero again. That's all there is to it. We are just rotating Mr. Qubit. And the final axis, the Z axis, is very strange uh, because now this thing is pointing up. So we are 100% becoming zero. And we apply the, the Z gate. We are still 100% being zero. We apply it again, and nothing changed. We are still zero. So Roy, you might ask, why are we doing this? Because nothing is happening. What is there? Because now you can see Mr. Qubit. Now you can't. He's gone. Where is he? There he is. He's still here. We are encoding some information into Mr. Qubit. 
it's just not the probability. We aren't changing the outcome, but we are we are putting information into this system. It's no longer looking like this. It's not looking like this. So this is a very important thing. Using uh, using these poly gates and any gate, um, we encode information, and sometimes we change the probability. So we can store more information into a qubit than just the probability of it becoming a zero and a one. In Java code, though, if we want to use this, um, I'm now using the, the common small three uh, library, which has matrix operations. Uh, we still have the same qubit. And now we enter this poly gate, which is just 0, 1, 1, 0. This matrix operation, we can apply to the system. And if we will do the same measurement, like again, uh, like we did before, with the random uh, method of random, we now get a 0 or a 1 from this. It's that simple to program a quantum uh, simulator. One, one thing to note, uh, all the quantum gates are unitary, which means that if you apply it and you apply it again, you get back to the original state. This means that if you have a, a complete quantum program and you run it, then you run it backwards in reverse, you undo everything. So there's like an automatic undo because you can just apply everything the second time and you get back to your starting point. Unless you do a measurement, because when you do a measurement, for example, if it's oriented like this and we do a measurement, bloop, suddenly it jumps back to being zero and you've changed the system. There's no way to go back to the original state. This destroys the entire system. All the qubits now flip into either a zero or a one. So this destroys everything you've done. And this is very weird and takes a lot to get used to. But there are more fun gates, like these gates we just discussed, they flip from zero to one and one to zero. But Hadamar, he was a real badass. He could do, um, like you can already see, he's introducing a, 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 a more advanced like gate thingy. And it turns out it does something weird. Like, we are no longer using this axis or this axis or this axis. We are using this magical axis. So what happens if we use this magical axis and we give it a swing? This happens. So now we are no longer zero. We are something in between. If we apply it again, though, we'll end up with what we started with. So we are zero. Now we are in superposition between zero and one, and now we are back to zero again. And the same is true, is true if it was already a one. If we would apply it, we go into a superposition and we apply it again, we go back to it being a one. So it's like the same thing. We just manipulate our qubit around some axis uh, using some magical matrix operation. And suddenly our qubit is in a superposition. It's now somewhere in between a zero and a one. And if we measure it, it suddenly flips to become a zero or it flips to become a one, which is very weird. But in code, it's not very different because we are doing the same thing. It's just a different matrix here, but the code is entirely the same. We are just using different numbers. Now we have to talk about cats. Um, Schrodinger's cat, for example. Schrodinger, another uh, famous uh, physicist and math, uh, what do you call it? Mad guy. Um, Mathemat he mathematician. Mathematician, thank you. All right. Uh, a famous mathematician and uh, physicist. He didn't believe, just like Einstein, that this magical quantum stuff could possibly be real because it's just too weird. It's just too weird. So, he had this weird experiment where you take a box, uh, you put in some label poison and uh, a decaying atom. And if that atom decays, the poison gets released and the cat is killed. Poor cat. Now we seal the box and we put it away. And we don't know if this atom decays. Is the cat dead or is it alive or is it both at the same time? Well, He's just mocking. He's making fun of the whole quantum thing uh, because we all know if the dead's, if the cat's dead or alive, at some point it happens and he dies. And that's sad. We don't want to kill cats. 
But the same thing is true for our Mr. Qubit. If we if we apply the Hadamard operation, so what is it? If we measure this, it's it's right now it's like this. But is it the zero or is it the one? We don't know until we until we measure it. Or do we? This is a, a very weird question. Um, the cat survived, luckily. Uh, so we can also do operations on qubits, on multiple qubits. So for example, in the right here, you see a small diagram. And this diagram shows the first line is the first qubit. And the second line is the second qubit. And both of them are initialized as 0. That's what the small 0 at the, at the at start says. And we do an operation on both of them. So if you have um, uh, if you are programming a quantum computer, most of these programs are using a visual language like this to uh, to visualize the qubits and the operations you do. So in this case, the black dot is the control node, and the second is the not operation. If the first qubit is in the end measured and it is a zero at that time, the second one gets flipped. And if it's a one, the second one does not get flipped. And this small matrix you can see uh, says just that. Um, and actually, you can see the small uh, the not operation. It's in the bottom corner of this matrix. So the math kind of makes sense if you if you know if you are a mathematician. It becomes even weirder if you add, uh, it's like the, 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 the thing we have here is almost the same, but we now have a small Hadamard operation in front. So let's think about what happens. We have this first qubit. We'll use Mr. Qubit. We do a Hadamard operation and it's in the superposition. It's not zero, it's not one, it's in between. And now we do the control knot. So if the first qubit is measured and it suddenly flips to a zero, this means the second one does not get flipped. If the first one is measured and it flips to become a one, this automatically means the second one must also be flipped because they're now tied together. This bell state is the same thing as quantum entanglement. These two uh, systems are now entangled. You can no longer uh, reason about them in a single state. They are, well, it may, basically now this is a very binary state. If one is zero, the other one will always be zero once you measure this. And if the first one is one, the second one will always be a one. And this is even true if you would entangle these things, uh, keep one on Earth, send the other to Mars. If you measure them at that point in time, it flips to become zero or one. And the other one on Mars, if you measure it, becomes zero or one. So right now, there's no way to send information like this faster than light. We do, however, have a method to, um, to check if this theory is actually true. But we'll come to that later. But first, some Java code again. Um, in, this, in this case, we have four different states. And we have uh, two qubits. Um, so I wrote this little meta language where I make a quantum system. It has a Hadamard gate and it has a controlled knot. And if we measure uh, one of the states now, um, zero, zero will be about 50% of the time. Zero, one and one, zero will never be measured. And zero, uh, one, one will be all, also around 50% of the time. So you can see there is no longer a, uh, they are entangled. It, they're either both zero or both in one. And just using the two operations we already know, uh, knew. So this is what Einstein called spooky action at the distance, or in my best German, spookhafte Fernwickung. But Einstein did not believe this was true. Einstein, he thought the whole quantum stuff was idiotic. It, there's no way information or the decision travels faster than light. There has to be some hidden variable uh, already in these particles that will determine if it's a one or a zero. We are just measuring it at a different time. And um, he had uh, he thought there there should be explanations. Turns out though there is a test, and there is a very weird test we can do, which actually proves 
these systems make up their mind at that particular point in time, not before that. There's no information before that. There's no predetermined plan. So let's create a particle from nothing but pure energy. This is something we can do. We can create something from pure, pure energy. And at that point, we create two particles and they've got a spin. And I'm visualizing this again as a physical uh, spinning coin, but they are not actually spinning. It's a property they have that's called spin. And this, this spin is always completely opposite to each other if you create two particles uh, from pure energy at the same time. These particles are basically entangled because they do the exact opposite. We can do this in a laboratorium. Now we have two different de detectors. The first particle goes into the first detector, the second one in the second detector, and we measure them in three directions. This is where it becomes a little bit weird, but if we will measure them on the same axis, um, they will always disagree with each other because these particles are opposite. If we measure them uh, uh, vertically, the one will always say up, then the other will say down because these particles will always disagree with each other because they are the exact opposite of each other. In a different angle, they will always disagree with each other. But if we have two different angles, we don't know. Could be either way. They could, um, um, if, if, it's, if it flips like this, it could be um, flip like this or flip like this. So it's no longer trivial that they disagree with each other. So now we imagine or we think, um, what if there is a predetermined plan? So case one, there is a plan. And let's just make some random plan. If we measure this angle, the first particle will say up, then the second will disagree, will say down. And in the other angles, this is the outcome. This is just one example plan, uh, one example plan for these particles. So we have three different directions, three different outcomes. They disagree with each other. And now we can make the entire table of all possible outcomes if we uh, mix up the ways we measure. So in the first case, if we measure up and up, they disagree with each other. If we measure in these directions, they actually agree with each other using this predetermined plan because they both point outwards. In this case, they disagree, and we can fill this entire table. And for this particular random plan we made, five out of nine times, they disagree with each other. And uh, in the other cases, they agree. So there's a 55.6% chance of disagreeal. Now, if we would, this is, was just one uh, example plan, but there are other plans, of course. And if you would write out all these plans and you would do the calculations, which are not that hard, you'll see that six of the plans uh, have a 55% chance of disagreeing. And there are two plans uh, which always disagree with each other. So that's 100%. So if we would do these random measurements in a laboratory, we would expect at least around 55% chance disagree. This is case one. If there is a plan, 55% chance disagree. So, what if quantum computing or quantum probabilities are real? If the first one is measured like this, the second flips down. This changes the system. It's now pointing down. So what are the odds of measuring it up? Well, that's zero. What are the odds of it measuring uh, down like this? It's 55%, uh, 75% and 75% at the other angle. In the end, it's a 50-50 split. So if quantum probabilities are true, <laughs> another open value guy, if quantum probabilities are true, 50% of the time, disagreeal. So they did the actual experiments and you can already guess where this is going because otherwise I won't be doing this talk. Outcome, 50%. So this actually proves that these quantum effects are real. There is no 
predetermined plan. There is no encoded information into these particles. We separate them, we send one to Mars, one on Earth, and at the moment we measure them at Earth, something happens at Mars that determines their outcome. And this actually goes faster than light, but you can no longer, you can't like exchange information faster than light because these particles have to originate from a single point. Then they travel outwards and then they make up their mind. So we still have to like move them out of each other. So there's no, it doesn't break any fundamental laws of physics, but it's still very weird. So we've seen these effects. We know how qubits work. How do you actually build a program using these weird effects? So that's what we're going to look at next. How do these algorithms work? So the first one is Grover's algorithm. And um, it's not based on Grover, but there's a guy named Grover. And it goes, uh, uh, it works on unordered data. So for example, you have a database uh, completely randomized and you want to find one particular re record. So how, do you, how would you do this on a, on a classical computer? Um, either you sort all the data first and then you uh, do a binary search to find your item. But we don't want to do this. This is unordered data. So in the classical computer, there's only one option left. We just follow the lines until we find the one we're looking for. This is an O N step. So if you've got N items, you might need N steps to find your item. In a quantum computer, we can do something strange. First, we assign each card a, an equal probability. So we know how to do this, equal probabilities and entanglement, which just means the Hadamard operation. And now we need the second thing, which is an Oracle function, not based on Oracle, um, but a function that, uh, that says, um, that returns a one for the card we want and a zero for all the other cards. So we apply this to all the cards in our system and only returns one for the one we want. So we can't actually apply this on our system because we need an undo function. So because all the gates in a quantum computer are uh, unitary, we can undo this. So we can not say the probability of everything becomes, uh, becomes zero and just the cards we want becomes one because this is not an operation we can undo. What we can do, however, is flip, like the same thing we did with Mr. Qubit, we flip his face. So we encode some different information where we don't change the probability, which we can undo. That's the thing we do here. So in this case, we have uh, 13 numbers. The seventh is the card we want, and we flip the probability of this uh, Oracle function because of the Oracle function. And now we do a second thing. We amplify our result. So what do we do? We uh, flip something again, but we flip uh, uh, based on the average. If we do this, we take the average and we flip everything around this axis, you see that card seven now is much more likely to be picked than all the other cards. And if we would do this again, the following will happen. And if we now take a measurement, it's very likely that qubit seven will be one and the others will be zero. We're not, not a particular, but this state will become obvious. And it turns out Grover is faster than ON. You can actually find something in unordered data much faster than you would normally be able to find something. Um, this is not something that's going to be used in a database anytime soon because we can just store information in a sorted way. But this small um, algorithm or this small trick is being used in a lot of different quantum algorithms as a building block. So it's the basis of a lot of different algorithms. The most fun algorithm though, though is, uh, is Shor's algorithm and it's the one uh, almost everyone wants to know how it works because it breaks all internet security, which is something you should be scared of, uh, actually, Brian. Yeah, well, well, well. I mean, it's it's it sounds scary, but first uh, let it uh, let it come over. It's still these huge giant computers, and um, but yeah, yeah, we have to we have to look out for that, I guess. Yeah, I'll come back to that later. So, why is this very important? Well. 
almost all internet security at the moment is based on prime factorization. Well, it's based on the fact that we can't do prime factorization. So we are using a lot of big keys, which are composite uh, numbers based on two prime numbers. And the whole trick is uh, I've got my prime number, Brian, you've got your prime number and the big number multiplied together. We can share that freely because nobody will be able to guess one of our prime numbers. So how would you do prime factorization on a normal computer? Well, just try it. Divide by two? Yeah, no. Divide by three? No. Divide by five? No. Divide by seven? No, et cetera. This is the, basically the only way we have to do factorization on a classical computer. And that's why it's very, very slow. So how does Shor's algorithm work? Well, it's actually four simple steps. So first uh, we have this big number N and we want to factor this number N. Um, we pick a random number, which is smaller than N. Again, all these sh weird random numbers. Again, we pick a random number. Then we check if A, the random number we pick, is a factor of N. Because if we were very lucky and we have this very big number, we pick the random number and it is actually a prime factor, we can stop, we are done. But there's like a one in a billion chance that would happen, but still. So in our example, um, N is 15 a very large number, and we picked a random number seven. I picked 15 because at the moment I made this presentation, 15 is the largest number we factored on a quantum computer. So we are not quite there yet, but it's coming. So step one, pick a random number, we picked seven. Now step two is we have to find the period. And what do we mean by a period? Um, let's just see the example. 7 to the power of 1 mod 15 is 7. 7 to the power of 2 mod 15 is 4. 13, 1, 7, 4, 13. You can see a pattern to appear here. And this pattern is actually uh, the thing we need. So in this case, this pattern starts to repeat after four steps. And this pattern is guaranteed to repeat. And we want to find this period. And in this case, our period is 4. We can keep this information. And now uh, uh, we have a small control step. If R is odd, or if the following equation equals zero, we have to go back to step one and try again. We didn't pick the right random number. There's about, I think it's about 25% chance of being the wrong number, and then you have to start over. It's not that bad. And actually, if we have these four uh, numbers, so we have the big number so 15, we have seven and we have four, we can just plug it into this calculation to find the prime numbers. It's that simple. And we can do this on a classical computer very quickly and you'll get three and five. And it works because three times five is 15. So pick a number, find this period, check the period and calculate the prime factors. It's that easy to break all the internet security at the moment. The only problem, finding the period. Because this small step finding the period, um, this calculation is the same problem as just trying each and every prime number, uh, which we had before. On a classical computer, this is, as this is even slower than the, the, the normal classical way of checking. But on a quantum computer, we can do something that's called a quantum Fourier transformation. First, we take a lot of qubits and we entangle them. And we know how to do this, it's the Hadamard operation. Then we can encode this information into this. So we have those, those numbers 7, 4, 13, 1, 7, 4, 13, 1. We can encode this into our system. And now all these numbers have an equal probability. So if we would take a measurement, we get 7, for example, which is useless because we don't want 7, we want the period. We want to know when it repeats. To do this, we need to transform everything we have from the time domain into a frequency domain. So what does this look like? Well, if you plot it on a graph and you have this pattern, it starts to, it starts to um, reappear. If you do a Fourier transformation on this pattern to take it from the time domain into a frequency domain, you'll nicely get these four peaks. And this is the answer we want, four peaks. So for example, if we would take 128 different numbers as input, and we do this Fourier transformation, we will get the following um, probabilities. 
But this still isn't good enough because if we now take a random measurement, we would, for example, measure 65, which is somewhere between zero and 128, but it says nothing about our period we, because we want to find four. That's what we want. We want to measure four. Now we measure uh, 65. Now, if we do the same thing again, we set everything up and we do a second measurement, we get 98, which is again useless. We do a second, a third measurement, a fourth measurement, a fifth measurement. We get some numbers out of this, but these numbers at the moment, they don't say anything about our number. We want four. But it turns out these numbers actually do mean something. But if you would take these numbers and uh, based on the zero to 128, they are fractions. Uh, for example, 65, it's dead in the center. So if we would just have this single measurement, we could assume it's in the middle. So it's probably split in the middle. It's, it's one over two, it's 50%. There's uh, two bumps. Or it could be two thirds, or it could be four eighths, or it could be eight sixteenths. Uh, but the most likely is one over two. But if you add the second measurement, you'll see the common denominator becoming four. So it's either two fourths, three fourths, two fourths, or very close to that. And that actually from that, after a couple of measurements, we can conclude that the period we are looking for is most likely four. So how fast is this algorithm? Um, I did a little bit of Googling and um, the fastest way on a classical computer to do this is this big O notation, which I can't read, but luckily there's a graph. And then I Googled the Shores algorithm and someone uh, estimates it's 72 log n to the power of three. Uh, fun fact though, the guy who answered that was actually Peter Shore. He himself does not know how fast this algorithm is, but someone else did some research and this is the best estimate they have. If you will plot it on a graph though, you can easily see um, that the general uh, number field sieve grows very quickly and Shor's algorithm stays constant. Well, not constant, it's, uh, it has constant growth. So if you have a very big number, thousand bits, and you would go up it will probably take around 100 years on our current computers in using classical algorithm. If we have a gigabyte uh, quantum machine, we could do it in under a second or under 100 seconds, very fast. So Brian, tip for you, it, you need to start thinking about post-quantum cryptography. Uh, there are a couple of algorithms you can use that are safe for quantum computers, even if quantum computers become powerful enough. So you can use lattice-based security, multivariate equations, hash-based security, code-based security, or super singular elliptic curves. Those are, as far as we know right now, safe for quantum computers. So you might say at the moment, quantum computers aren't as powerful yet, but don't forget that people are already storing all your encrypted information. So Right now, I think the government in the US, they are storing all your information, even the encrypted information, because in 10 years time, they'll probably have a quantum computer. And at that moment, they can read back everything you've said up to now. You can, they can see all your banking accounts, all your passwords, everything you've encoded before, which you thought was safe, but they're storing it right now so they can read it later. So even if these quantum computers are not here yet, I don't want them to know my password in 10 years. So I'm not feeling safe anymore. So that's something to think about. Ah, that's, that, that, that is true, but you say hash-based. So hopefully most passwords are hash-based encrypted. So it's not possible to, to uh, or one way encrypted. So it's not possible to turn them back. But what you said about uh, your banking accounts and all your information that is absolutely absolutely it true it goes through us servers and they can just store every data every bit of data even if, if even if they don't have their password so maybe yeah your password is being stored as a hash but all your data all your uh, um, your your password is not stored as plain text but it's going on a wire and that wire is it's not being hashed at the front end it's being hashed at the back end so 
I, going I, on the wire I, is your password encrypted using SS, uh, SSL, but yeah. Well, th 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 thank God we have GDPR here in Europe, right? <laughs> Makes it ever even worse, actually. So um, that basically concludes the story and that, that, that with our little friend. If you want to learn more about quantum computing, um, IBM has, has a great website. Um, you can actually use their own quantum computers. They've got quantum computers. I think they've even got like a 10 qubit system. I know they've got five qubit systems, but I, do, I think they have larger systems now. You can just go online, use them, um, and play with them. The simulators are faster and more reliable, but you could use actual quantum computers in the cloud right now if you sign up. Um, there are simulators online which you can use, which are very cool. Uh, Scott Aronson actually helped me uh, with a couple of questions in the presentation. He's got a, a blog on quantum computing, a very good blog. And all the code I showed is available here. And um, well, this slide was still from code one, but if there are any questions, go ahead. So the, the, the basic problem now with quantum computing is that we need to get these qubits as cold as possible. So the temperature thing is now, uh, the physical temperature, temperature thing is now the problem. Is that, is that correct? Well, it's not just the, the temperature itself. It's um, these, these systems are just unstable. So we know how to do a couple of calculations, um, but if you do more and more calculations with them, if you do more uh, operations on them, they become unstable and you can no longer rely on the outcome. So there are a couple of problems. Uh, one is the fidelity. So you, you need to be able to do more calculations be, before they become useless. The second is we need more qubits at the same time. But more qubits at the same time also means uh, that you have to keep them fresh, working for longer. And so it, it's, a, it's the whole problem of scaling. So just having uh, more qubits does not solve the problem. You also have to have better quality qubits. And because these things deteriorate, you also want to have error correction and error detection in it. So these are three fields where quantum computing is, is still struggling. And it's not physically getting these things cold because we can freeze everything, just cost energy, but it is actually manipulating them and, and not messing them up in process. So we, we need to basically stabilize this whole technique to make sure that it, uh, that it, will, that, that it will actually be feasible to, to work and that yep. you have it as, as yeah, well, say in, in, in somewhat years, have it uh, instead of your phone having a quantum computer in your pocket. Yeah, so I don't think that, that that's gonna work uh, anytime soon. And, and I think the, the, the first quantum computers you will use will be on the cloud. So in some data center, there will be a very powerful quantum computer and you can buy time to run something on that quantum computer. So that's already happening with IBM, for example. Yeah, so basically the way as we were buying time on a supercomputer, say a decade ago, that will probably be the way that quantum computing will be uh, inserted yeah. into, uh, into our world. Yes, and even the, 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 the physical machines, they, they, they haven't settled yet on the best way to build a quantum machine. There are like different impl implementation uh, methods. You can use the, the photon pot photorization, you can use Josephson junctions, and all these companies are, are trying out these things and competing with each other and making the best qubits. So uh, the whole field hasn't even settled on a single technology that will bring us quantum computers. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, it's hard to predict when this will, will happen, but of course uh, it, can oh, be, no. it can be sooner than we expect and maybe it will take a decade or two before it will no, be. No. Uh, right. Well, all right. I, um, about right, a month yeah, ago, yeah, Google claimed quantum supremacy. Uh, quantum supremacy means that they have something running on a quantum computer that is faster than anything they could do on a classical computer. And Google claims they have actually done this. This is a very specific problem written especially for quantum computers, um, which has to do with quantum probability. And they done uh, they've done a calculation on a quantum computer and they say to verify this on a regular computer it would take thousands of years ibm quickly came back to them and said well we can do that in a day um, but still um, 
there's nowhere near what what the quantum computer did because it did it in a couple of seconds so they claim they have something that's faster on a quantum computer than a regular computer which hasn't been done before so breakthroughs are happening okay sounds 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 interesting and uh, something to to look at for to look at to 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 be on the lookout for 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 into the, the near future uh, i mean let's see what happens yeah all right um well, Roy, I uh, want to uh, want to thank you for uh, for being here, for for explaining it, for uh, uh, for showing us uh, for showing us Mr. Qubit. I I feel that with that with that sphere and and the way it works, that uh, that 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 is more well easier to understand what that superposition is because before that it was just a vague uh, yeah vague thing to me and I couldn't uh, couldn't see it that way. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, uh, well, um, this is probably uh, I don't I don't see any any uh, new questions up on the on the ch on the channel. Um, oh, somebody says, uh, uh, was the quantum supremacy cl claimed by Google? Was it really, or was it real, or was it fake? Uh, it's somebody says, uh, I mean, was the algorithm uh, uh, there really? What uh, was it? Was the real algorithm, or was it, uh, was it something artificial? Oh. I honestly don't know. So maybe you know. Yeah, no. Uh, there was a, there was first they posted it. NASA and and Google they they collaborated on this. They posted the paper online, and then suddenly they had a problem and they they withdrew it, and people copied it and started to read about this. Um, um, but it, it turns out after a couple of weeks uh, they did publish the article in the end and. Um, there was a bit of mystery behind it, but I do believe they actually did this. And uh, I do believe it is quantum supremacy, but it's not that groundbreaking. But most steps are not that groundbreaking. It's just little step by little step by little step by little step until we get a working quantum computer. Um, I don't think suddenly someone has a working full working quantum computer in, in your pocket. And that's not something that will happen anytime soon. But I do think Google did this thing. Uh, yeah probably true all right um if you have any any more questions uh, feel free to uh, to post them uh, in the in the in the slack channel um for now uh roy i really want to uh, want to thank you for for doing this uh get back to your party i mean it's uh, it's the uh, it's the office opening but thank you for doing this thank you for being there um the recording will be live immediately um if you have any questions afterwards feel free to put them in the live channel uh, and we try to, we will try to uh, uh, answer it, uh, or I will uh, uh, redirect them to Roy in any way possible. Uh, for now, thank you for watching. This was uh, another uh, another video session. Um, hopefully, uh, you liked it. Um, I'm not sure when the when the next one will be. I, I think it will all probably be in a week. We have uh, Trisha G, uh, who will talk about uh, uh, Spring, Kotlin, and Java FX. So if you want to see that. Uh, please uh, hang on and go to our meetup site and uh, enroll for that one. So thanks again for being here. Thanks again for watching. Thanks again, uh, thanks again Roy, and uh, see you all later. Thanks Bye. for inviting me.